We're in the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter uh, 23. My focus this morning will be starting in verse 27 there. Very interesting scripture here. I love, I love the way the Lord in His own words put things and some of these things, these truths that He's written to us in the Bible here is, are things that you and I should hold dear to our heart as well as take them serious today. A lot of these things people don't take serious. I don't really understand why. A lot of people don't have respect for God, but the fact is He's Lord. He's our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so If you have a red letter Bible like mine, all these words that's said this morning to be read, that's actually his his words when he was walking and talking amongst his his uh, or us back then. But anyway, if you don't mind with me, stand with me just for a few minutes. Let me read this little bit of scripture here, and I'll let you sit down. So the Bible says, "Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, uh, hypocrites, for ye." are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Verse 31 says, Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which kill the prophets. Fill ye up the open measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Let us pray. O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for getting us here safe, Lord. Thank you for our folks. Thank you for the sweet spirit, Lord. I ask you for the gift of preaching here for a little while. Lord, bless your word. Bless the messenger. Lord, help me to convey something, Lord, that would be helpful for your people, Lord, to help them grow spiritually, Lord. If they're here this morning and uh, discouraged or lost, or Lord, just lukewarm, ask it to be different. Lord, help this. What's said, Lord, your, your word uh, work in their heart. And let their spirit, their Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit, Lord, work in their heart as well, Lord, to help them this morning, Lord. These things we ask on your Son Jesus' most precious name. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. If you notice in, in Matthew chapter 23, there's a lot of woe, is what Jesus is saying. Woe unto you. You know, a lot of times we don't really look at what he's saying or we don't really think the gravity of what he was actually saying out of his own mouth. But you and I would think about it, this woe would have been a warning. Woe unto you, he's telling them. Uh, if you watch his words that he said, these words were very strong, but they, they could have been stronger. But the, and what I mean by that is he said, woe unto you, and then set them straight. He told them how it was, but if you look at it and really analyze how he said it and the manner that he said it, it was still in a very loving tongue. He was strict on them. He was hard on them. But yet, he was still loving. He was still loving and teaching them. The fact of it is, the Lord spent time on them trying to tell them and trying to correct them. And the fact of it was, he didn't just, just wash his hands with them and go away. Very, very important thing for us to see. He called them out. The, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the ones that were wicked. He truly called them out. But he didn't and just wash his hands and move on. That's an important thing for us to see right up front. Verse 27, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. He was trying earnestly to get their attention that their outward righteousness meant nothing but a facade for death and a stench that was within their hearts. It truly was. Now these harsh words that he used, he was comparing them and their righteousness to nothing more than a tomb or a place of death. When you and I think about it, the place that they would be placing these bodies, in my opinion, would be very smelly if you were in the tomb with them. These sepulchers were whitewashed at the time. They were, they were whitened up to make them look pretty. But the fact of it was, there was death still inside of it. It was consumed with death on the inside. That's all it was. Dead men's bones is what the Lord said. These men walked around in their righteous dress, but were no cleaner on the inside than the death that was in the tomb. That's an important fact to say based on what the Lord Jesus Christ tells us. Verse 28, No matter how they appeared to others, they were
were still nothing but full of hypocrisy as well as being just plain old iniquity. Full of iniquity. Truly was. In verse 29, the Bible says, Woe unto you, uh, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build your righteousness on your tradition that was the death of the prophets. So no matter how you dress it up, it's still filled with death. When I think of death and these sepulchers there, I don't know how they embalmed people at the time. I guess we could have studied that up. But the fact of it was, it was still rotting flesh and rotting bones in these dead sepulchers. truly was. Verse 30, In holding their heads high, saying, they would have not been part of the partaking of what was the death of to the prophets. But the fact of it was, they were still guilty of their self-righteousness. They truly were. Loaded up with iniquity, self-righteousness, walking around very pompous, looking in their dress and their attire, thinking of themselves higher than they should, they were still nothing more than dead rotting flesh on the inside. Amen goes there. Verse 31 tells us, because they are sons of the wicked and keeping their traditions of the fathers, they are condemning themselves. Walking in the same path as their fathers condemns themselves. Amen. Verse 32 says, Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Well, they were full with their wickedness as their fathers were. Notice in verse 33 the question that was asked. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? <laughs> Amen goes there. But this morning as we go through this scripture, notice the warning that Jesus Christ gave these scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Amen. He gave them a warning. Woe unto you! So when you think about this phrase, woe unto you, it appears only once in the Old Testament. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, the fact that Amos had, had written it down by inspiration of God in Amos chapter number 5 verse 18 where it says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Woe unto you. In the New Testament, we see it shows up 17 times alone in the gospel of Mark and Luke. Each time it was the spoken word of the Lord Jesus Christ out of his own mouth when he was in his physical form walking and talking with those during his ministry, earthly ministry. Jesus was calling them out. He truly was. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. The wrath of God will be poured out on you. It's what he was telling them. But still, like I said, it was in a very loving manner in that the fact that the Lord just didn't wash his hand, just fuss at them and go on. He truly didn't. He still tried to educate them, call them out, told them where they were wrong, laid it in their lap. That's an important thing for us to see it truly is. In this chapter alone, he denounces eight woes against their hypocrisy and the fact that their blindness in these things that they think is righteous in Matthew 23 alone. Verse 26, we see where Jesus called them out for being blinded by their own righteousness. They could not see beyond their own self-righteousness. They were blinded by the fact. Blinded by the fact of their tradition. Blind by, blinded by the fact of their family. Woe unto you should have caused some conviction in their heart. When I think of it this way, I always kind of think of me. I always try to read the Bible and apply it to me or apply it to what I know. And if, if I'm thinking about if I was there, what would the Lord said to me? He would have said, Woe unto you, Michael, is what he said. And that should have convicted me in my heart. Now when I think about it, I know I'm playing Monday morning quarterback here, but the fact of it was if he'd have said, this to me, I think it would have done something for me when he says, Woe unto you! It truly would. It should have rang something in my heart saying, There's a problem here that the Lord is trying to tell me that I need to correct. Why is that? Because I need to correct it when the Lord is telling us. Woe is me was heard once before in Isaiah chapter number 6 verse 5 where he said, Then I said, Woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah had his woe moment. He took care of it himself. Woe is me. I'm in some deep trouble here. I'm standing in front of 
God Almighty, woe is me, how unrighteous I am. I'm a man of unclean lips, is what his thought was. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips that are wicked. Oh, that's truly what it was. These Pharisees, Sadducees, and these hypocrites, they should have had a heart-piercing moment that went on when Jesus said, Woe unto you. So it appears there was no conviction of these hypocrites at the time. Now, I'm not saying there was never any conviction of these hypocrites or these Pharisees because the Bible just doesn't tell us. But at this moment here, no one seemed to come clean with the Lord. They really didn't based on what Scripture tells us. Maybe the Lord wanted us to see some more into it. He would have put it in there. He truly would have. So sure, some could have come to repentance repentance and called on Christ, but it just simply wasn't written in the Bible. It truly, honestly wasn't. Jesus warned his disciples of this same sickness that these scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees had. He truly did. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 6 the Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. These folks, righteous folks, they had a disease. It was called their righteousness disease. Their iniquity was there was slam full of it. They truly was. He talked about this leaven is what the Lord compared it to. The leaven of the Pharisees when you and I think about it is still alive today. Amen. It truly is. It's swollen up as big as it ever has been. It honestly has. The Apostle Paul in writing to the church of Galatia in Galatians chapter number 5 verse number 9 it says a little leaven leaven the whole lump. All it takes is a little bit. That little bit causes the whole lump. It truly honestly does. It's very contagious. The Apostle Paul saw it as a contagion, and it was. It truly is. In fact, many churches have that same self-righteousness today. They honestly do. Got to be careful of that. So this morning, I'm going to lay it in your lap this morning. I'm not preaching on anything that pertains to you. I'm just going off of what the Scripture gives me this morning. But I do want you to see these five truths that every Christian should steer clear of of the whitewashing of the righteousness. Amen. We need to steer clear of these things. The fact is, any doctrine other than the pure and perfect doctrine of Christ is whitewashed doctrine. It truly is. So when you think about that this morning, watch out for first truth is false doctrine. Doctrine truly matters. It honestly does. It matters. You know, when you think about it, it might not sound a whole lot, but any time we form our own opinions that are indifferent from the Word of God, we're kind of making up our own doctrine. We truly are. We've got to be very careful of that. Anything contrary to what God's Word says, anything indifferent from what Jesus Christ has for us is truly making up our own doctrine and we're walking in the ways of false doctrine and we truly are. The leaven of the Pharisees was steeped in false doctrine and totally made of man-made self-tradition. It truly honestly was. So when I thought about that and I studied that up, it is amazing to me that so many so-called Christians today have a long list of these man-made self traditions. It truly is. It's amazing. That's the, the, the fact of it is, that's kind of why you see a church on just about every corner is everybody has their own take on things and a lot of them are truly so far away from the doctrine of Christ and the things that God would have for them truly are so far away from it. It's sad. Why is that? Because of false doctrine. Because of, they did it their way. Like uh, you know the singer, whatever his, Frankie, whatever his name was, he did it his way. There's a lot of people doing it their way. And I'm going to be honest with you. We don't have a gospel that's like a Burger King gospel where you have it your way. You have it Christ's way. It's His way or no way. I don't really understand why people want to make it up their own way. And I know I've probably said that here before too, but the man that wrote that song, Me and Jesus, we got our old thing going. He just passed away last year and I'm sure he found out that he and Jesus didn't have an agreement. That's a sad fact. 
when he stood in front of Jesus, when he finally left out of here, he realized that he and Jesus did not have an agreement. He either, either agreed with Jesus Christ or he didn't agree at all. There was no agreement there. Jesus Christ is not going to bow down to whatever our opinions are on things. He's not going to do it. Right. He's not going to make a way for you to sin. and He's not going to do it. He, he's, he's not going to bend his doctrine for our opinion. I mean, it's just not going to happen. He's not going to do it. Amen. Me and Jesus, we ain't got our own thing going. Going. I want what Jesus has going. I don't want what I got going. Amen. I honestly don't. In Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thy own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. That's some very important scripture that the Lord tells us. A lot of times people get so hung up on themselves and what they're doing, they can't see the things of God for them. They can't see how they need to make things of God personal to them because they're too hung up on what other folks folks are doing. It really truly happens. You know, but the fact of it is, it really just comes down to a heart problem. All of these truths that I'll give you this morning, they really are a heart problem. Either your heart's right with God or it's not, but the fact of it is, it's a heart problem. It honestly is. You know, if our hearts does not have the proper motives, then we become infected with the same leaven as these Pharisees. We truly do. This same approach, if not stopped, will bring forth destruction. It truly will. And it will bring forth destructive doctrine. Honestly, honestly will. In 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 4, the Bible says, But there were false prophets among, also among the people, even as there shall be false teeper, teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring them upon themselves swift destruction. The Lord said it would be swift. It wouldn't take time. It wouldn't be a long suffering. It would have been swift destruction. So when you think about it. Some people are just carried away with any wind of doctrine. They truly are. Now, I think about this one a lot of time and I, I had someone that She's passed away on now, but she was so dear to my heart. I love this woman. And, and she had thoughts of religion and was, was you know brought up in a Christian home and had some good Christian raising, but the fact of it was is anybody come along and said, I seen a vision or a, this happened or a, you know, God sent me a message in my Cheerios or whatever. I mean, you this stuff is silly, but the fact of it was she'd latch on to that sort of thing, but she was just turned about with every little wind of doctrine. Whichever way the wind blew that morning, she was there. Oh yeah, I'm going to this place over here because the guy that's down there, he's got a vision of God and, and all this. It's just... And that's fact of it is we have a lot of people today that are searching for something that just gets tossed about with every wind of doctrine, everything that looks religious, they latch on to. It happens to them. It truly do. Some people are just carried away by that. They really are. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 14, the Bible says that when henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Well, when you know, I just talked about the guy that saw the vision and somebody that thought that the Lord sent them a message in their Cheerios, but the fact of it is, it's just a way for people to deceive. That's all it is. It's a way for people to kind of relieve you of your money, relieve you of your resources, relieve you of your time. It truly is, but that's what those people do. Why is that? Because they have a motive that's not God's motive. Amen. It truly isn't. Lead you down a path you should never go. They honestly will. Some people today are just carried about with every wind of doctrine. Number two, watch out for ungodly motives. That's a very important thing. You and I as a daily person trying to walk, or a daily as walking as a Christian, we should watch out for anything or anyone that has ungodly motives. That's a fact. It really is. In Matthew chapter 12, verse number 30, the Bible says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Amen. That's why I keep saying, never agree to disagree when it comes to doctrine. Amen. Never compromise when it comes to doctrine. Amen. So, why is that? Because anything that is not with God... 
is against God. It truly is. Not trying to be mean preacher this morning. Not trying to be mean doctrine on a stance. But I'm just saying, you can't do that. You can't agree to disagree. God's Word is true. Anything that is against it goes against the Word of God. It's contrary to Him. And guess what? It stands with the devil. Amen. It truly honestly does. Every Christian has to watch out for these ungodly motives. Amen. Why is that? In Matthew chapter 7, verse number 15, the Bible says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving, ravaging wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Amen. Yes, it does. Amen, it does. Every Christian has to watch out for these deceitful workers. We honestly do. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 13, the Bible says, For such false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and marvel not, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Amen. Every Christian has to make sure our own efforts with our standards do not join the ranks of these deceitful workers. Amen. Now, I love people's standards. I love people's convictions just as much as the next guy. But the fact of it is, when our standards and our convictions don't go along with what the Bible says, we're in, we're in, we're in trouble. We truly are. Every Christian has an action to reveal Christ in us. That's what we're supposed to do, not our own man-made, made-up things. We cannot be in name Christians only. We truly can't. Our actions, everything we do, if we call ourselves Christians, our every action should be a display of Christ in us. Honestly, we truly should. Amen. In Titus chapter 1, verse number 16, it says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abom abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. <laughs> Amen. We have to be careful of those. Every Christian has to be watchful of these things. Very watchful of these ungodly motives. Amen. If, we're, if we become a Christian in name only, and our actions show no evidence of Christ, then we're nothing more than an ungodly act. You say, Brother Walker, what do you mean by that? We're just, we're just an ungodly act. We're just putting on a show. That's all it is. Amen. In Matthew chapter 12, verse number 30, the Bible says, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. I know I've said that verse before, but it's worth repeating here. It truly is. Amen. We're either with Christ or we're not. Amen. Number three this morning. Watch out for these outward appearances. These outward appearances, even sometimes folks get caught up in this stuff. We truly do. You know, you and I, we try to get dressed up for church. We try to put on our best. But you know, it ain't always about our outwardly appearance. It's what our heart truly is. What we have on the inside is what really truly matters. Now, I'm glad everyone is dressed in here today. And I'm glad I'm wearing a suit. I'm glad the Lord blessed me with that. But the fact of it is, just because I look good on the outside, doesn't mean I look good on the inside. It's not where I'm at. It's what, the fact of it is having the suit on makes me nothing but someone dressed up. But my heart needs to be different. My heart needs to look like Christ, not just me looking like a church-going person on the outside. Amen. So watch out for the outwardly appearance. Why is that? Because in verse 27 it says, "...which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones." Right. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. It truly is. You can never trust just what you see with your eyes. Amen. Now think about it. You never can truly trust just what you see with your eyes. Don't ever really truly judge a book by its cover a lot of times. You hear, you do hear that quite often, but you can't always judge things by what you see a lot of times. You have to know a little more about it. Many people today get hung up on their outward appearance, but appearances are just as deceiving as the, the, the serpent in the garden. It honestly is. So the outward appearance doesn't reveal what people are really like. It really honestly doesn't. You know, physical looks, <laughs> they really don't show us the person's value or character. They really don't. It honestly doesn't. It doesn't show their faith or their, their faithfulness to God. It honestly doesn't. The outward appearance shows that and doesn't show that at all. Outward qualities are, by definition, superficial. 
That's all it is. Amen. God only cares about what's in our heart. Amen. You know, you and I should try to look like Christians. We truly should. But the fact of it is, our heart's got to really be looking like that. Our heart needs to look like Him. It don't need to be hung up on our outwardly appearance. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, the Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen. Amen goes there. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, the Bible says, And when he had removed them, raised them up unto David, to be their king to him also, he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Amen. Now you and I both know, if you've been in church any time in your life, you probably know a lot about King David and his downfall and his sin. We know that he was a murderer and an adulterer, and on top of that, he sent a man in to be murdered. He truly, honestly did. But God saw David as a man of deep, abiding faith, who wholly was committed to the Lord. He truly was. God saw him as a man after his own heart. Why is that? Well, God looked at the man's heart. He didn't look at what the man was wearing. Amen. He truly honestly didn't. God saw the man who would depend on the Lord for strength and guidance. He truly honestly did. God saw a man who would recognize his sin and failure and who would repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness. Amen. He honestly did. God saw in David a man who loved the Lord, a man who worshipped his Lord with all of his being. He was a man who had experience in God's cleansing and forgiveness. He truly was. He was a man after God's own heart. God saw a man with a sincere and a personal relationship with his Creator. That's what he saw in King David. So when God looked at the heart of David... He truly saw a man after his own heart. He truly did. Amen. Number four this morning, a wicked heart. This is kind of an important thing right here. There's a lot of folks out there with wicked hearts. There's a lot of folks that are saved that have a lot of characteristics of having a very wicked heart. Those are some really things that the Lord is showing us here. It's nothing more than these sepulchers that have been whitewashed. For in verse 27 it says, For ye are unlike whitewashed sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones. A wicked heart is full of death and destruction. It truly is. A wicked heart is experienced in created confusion and contention. Amen. It honestly is. A wicked heart are experts in fooling others with their smooth speech and flattering words. Amen. Amen goes there. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 10 says, The soul of the wicked desireth evil. His neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. Every Christian has to watch out for this one. The wicked heart can become a problem for any one of us. It truly can. Why is that? Well, it all goes back to what Jeremiah the prophet said in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9, when he said, The heart is deceitfully above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You and I have to be careful. Our heart can be deceitfully wicked. Jeremiah said, who can know it? What that means is our, our heart could be so wicked, you don't even know how wicked it is. You don't even know how wicked it is. Every Christian has to watch out for it. And just like I said, each one of these truths is nothing more than a heart condition. Knowing that it is a heart condition, every Christian should watch out for it. We truly should. Number five this morning. You might get a little chuckle out of this one. Bad actors... It's either bad actors or good actors. I guess you can make up your mind on it and on. I don't, I don't really know. I've heard people say the word bad actors or good actors. But anyway, an act's an act. It truly is. Like if you were a theater person or you like Shakespeare, an act is an act. And an actor is an actor whether it's good or bad. But the fact of it is, in verse 28, Even so ye are also uh, outwardly appear righteous unto man, but within... Ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Notice Jesus Christ was calling these actors out. You might say they're bad or good actors. I don't know, but they were actors. He was calling them out. Why is that? Because they were putting on the dog for all their friends to show them how righteous they were. And what? no more righteous than anything. The Lord said they had death in their hearts. Notice this 
Hypocrisy was in the way and the life of these Pharisees and Sadducees. It was a daily tradition. They would get up in the morning and put on their, their actor, they put on their costume, and they would go out. They truly, honestly would. In the case of the hypocrites, it is sad state of a person who reduces himself to being nothing more than an actor on stage. That's this hypocrite, it honestly was. There are so many people who live their lives in desperate search for human approval and applause. Amen. There's a lot of people, even around us today. I would honestly venture to say there's probably a lot of people standing up today uh, doing something probably like preaching that says, you know, they're just looking for like accolades from man. They truly are. They discern their dignity and worth not from God, but from what men think of them. They're nothing but actors. They honestly are. They're willing to adapt themselves to win approval of men. There's a lot of them doing it. Amen. You and I have to watch out for it. They are willing to play many roles, wear many masks, and give audience what they want. Amen. Amen goes there. They're like actors on a stage who seek applause and approval. Amen. And in Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 1, the Bible says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Amen. That's a sad one right there. It honestly is. Truly is. I keep thinking of how that Levite, you remember the Levite that was involved with, with, with Jesus when he was preaching and he was telling them about the, the, the Samaritan? You remember the Levite that came along and saw the guy that was laying in the ditch and just went on about his way? He actually stopped and looked at him. I keep thinking about this Levite and I think, you know, I'm kind of thinking maybe if the Levite could have got an audience, maybe he would have stopped and helped the man. Why is that? Well, because he was a religious person. And it's amazing to me how many religious people will, once they get an audience, you know, they're ready to help somebody. But if they can't get an audience for somebody to see them do anything, they just, they won't, they won't help at all. But that's the fact. That's how that works out a lot of times. That's truly how that works out a lot of times. I got a sad illustration for you this morning. And I know I talk a lot about my family, but I remember my dad as a little boy when he was telling me these things. Is his father passed away and his father was a religious man, would go in his prayer calls and pray. Good man of God was my grandfather. I never knew him, but from what my family has told me, I understand that he was a praying man. He was a Christian. He was born again, but the fact of it was, he passed away when my daddy was about eight years old. And then as my dad and my dad's sisters and my, and my grandmother was trying to make it on their own, very poor, they were sharecroppers anyway, they would be people that would come along and try to help. But the fact of it was, there was people that would come along and try to help, but they would bring a crowd with them. And the crowd was the problem, and that's kind of where my, I'm going with my story this morning is, I remember my dad for many, many years. Many years, far back as I could remember as a little boy, my dad would never have anything to do with any church things related at all. When I was a kid, I was always involved with Vacation Bible School. I was always involved with programs. You remember Vacation Bible School had a main event at the end of the week and parents were invited. My dad never would go. He hardly ever would have anything to do with it. Matter of fact, I remember one time when I was part of the, the boys' RAs at the church and we had things going on and it got all the way down down to where we had a father and son dinner that night or something like that and then that night something came up my dad couldn't go and I, I know my dad was a little sorry about not going because it meant so much to me but the fact of it was my dad wanted nothing to do with church people you say brother Walker you being mean no I'm not here's why because when he was a little boy they were go hungry for weeks on end Having nothing, be an eight-year-old, go hungry, and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden when people showed up, they'd bring a crowd with them. And the crowd would be the crowd from the church, and they would be like, look what we're doing for this poor family. But the fact of it was, when I think about this, every time I think about it, those people were nothing more than these old Pharisees and Sadducees that showed up to show everybody how righteous they was just to do something for this poor family. But that's a fact. But you know what it did? It caused my dad to never step foot in a church for 40 something years, far back as I can remember. He would not have anything to do with it. Believe it or not, and you think, well, Brother Walker, how did you even get to be a preacher? I don't know, but I tell you this much. My dad just despised 
pastors and preachers. He honestly did. I don't think he ever met one that had enough love in his heart to really try to help my dad. He just despised them. Growing up, he must have ran into some monsters, is all I got to say. He must have ran into some self-righteous monsters. That's the only thing I can say. So when I got to the point where God's calling me to do something in ministry, I'm like, I don't know if I need to discuss this with my dad or not. My dad's going to look at me the same way he's looked at his other people. But the fact of it was, it was my mom's love for my dad that asked my dad every Sunday, James, you want to go to church with me today? Every Sunday. James, you want to go to church with me today? After 43 years plus of my, my mom asking my dad, James, you want to go to church with me today? My dad finally said, yeah, I reckon I'll go. Where do you want to go? My mom's like, anywhere you want to go. So they ended up going to church. It wasn't too long after that my father got saved in church. I think he finally found a preacher that he somewhat trusted because the man showed him some love. But the fact of it is, where I'm going with this this morning is you and I, as Christians, we need to make sure we don't have this righteous facade and go around looking for credit and stuff. Why is it? Because it ruins people's lives. It truly does. When we show up and be so self-righteous and stuff, it does people no good. You know, the best thing you can do for people is when you do something for somebody and you never tell a soul. Amen. That is the best thing to do if you want to help somebody. Do something for them. Don't even let them know you've done it. Amen. I'm not being mean this morning. I'm just saying that's what happened to my father. That's why this is so important to me. This whitewash facade is what the Lord's talking about can happen to all of us. We have to watch out for that stuff. They keep thinking of how righteous they are, but inside all they're looking for is man's arms. They want to be patted on the back. It's a horrible place to be. Every Christian has to watch out for that. Why is that? Well, because all of our actions must truly line up with the heart of Jesus Christ. There's no way around it. Our heart has to line up with Him 100%. It truly does. People need to see something real in us. They truly do. If we're Christians, we need to be real. You say, Brother Walker, what do you mean? We need to live real. This whole generation that's coming up, these young people, they don't see nothing real in religion. Why is that? Because people that call themselves Christians, they don't live like Christians. They really honestly don't. They're not loving and caring. Some of them aren't. You guys, I, I know how sweet you all are. I'm not fussing at you this morning. I'm just saying we have to watch out for that. Why is that? Because it creeps in. I don't care how loving you are or sweet you are this morning. Your heart is deceitfully wicked and can be infected with this leaven of the Pharisees. It truly honestly could. We have to be very careful. Every Christian has to watch out for that. Our actions must line up with what Jesus Christ has done in our hearts. Must line up. People have to see something real in us. Truly honestly do. Things we do out of love for others is because we have the love of Christ in us. That's the truth right there. Honestly, that's the truth. Amen goes there. So it's back to what I just said. It's all a matter of the heart. It truly is. What, do, what are the things we love? If we love the Lord, the love of Him is in us. We'll love others. We truly honestly do. So how do we be aware of the leaven of the Sadducees and Pharisees? Let me give them back to you this morning. Uh, we need to make sure our heart never becomes whitewashed as these sepulchers. Now when I was a little boy, I, I found my first uh, yellow jacket nest whitewashing fence post. I'll never forget that. First time I'd ever whitewashed fence post. My dad sent us out there. We had a farm in Hickory Tavern. And the first thing you do is you go through and you peel the bark off the cedar post. If anybody's ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. After a while, the, the post dries out. The cedar bark's still there and you can just grab the cedar bark and pull it off. Well, dad sent us through, me and my sister, and we were peeling the bark off the post. And then dad made up this whitewash stuff. It was some kind of mix of maybe lime or something and water or whatever. Maybe some kerosene on don't remember but it was all in there and then once we got it done we would whitewash these posts and the fact of it was some of those posts were rotten but we whitewashed them anyway they were rotten they were dead they were laying there and just not even holding much up but we whitewashed them anyway 
We don't want our hearts to be that same way. If we're going to put on Christ's clothes of righteousness, our hearts should have Him in it. We truly, honestly do. Here it is. Last, uh, let me give them back to you. Number one is watch out for the false doctrine. Number two is pay careful attention to ungodly motives this morning. Number three, look for more than just outward appearances. Amen. Number four, carefully watch for signs of a wicked heart. It could even be your wicked heart. Watch for signs of those. Amen. And number five, be watchful of bad actors. There's a lot of bad actors in the world and you and I have to be very careful to watch out for those bad actors. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for having us here this morning, Lord. Thank you for getting us here safely, Lord. Thank you for the word that was said, Lord. I ask it to be something, Lord, that would help your people. Lord, I just preached the scripture. I did the best I could with it, Lord, with what abilities that I have, Lord. I ask you to bless what was said to be something to help your people. If not, Lord, to help uh, your people tell other people what needs to be done and what needs to be uh, done in their heart, Lord. Lord, I just ask for someone that drives by this church today that they see us here, Lord, and maybe they stop in even after services. Lord, maybe they'll get saved this morning. These things we ask, Lord, in your Son Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Alright, grab your hymnal with me this morning. Stand up. Turn over to page 356. Let's sing a little bit of I Must Tell Jesus. And if you need altar time this morning... Oh, wait a minute. Wrong one. Turn over to page 308. I apologize. Page 308, I surrender all. And if you need altar time this morning, if you'd like to come and pray, by all means, please do. All to Jesus I surrender to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee my blessing Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Well, amen. All hearts and minds clear this morning? All right. Uh, I know Brother Ed wanted to come up. Someone pray for us real quick. Brother Brian, would you pray for us real quick? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, that you, when you say this, Father, that you clean the inside of us, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you love us regardless of what we often are and the way sometimes that we behave. Father, help us that we might pay attention to things that we say and how we act. Lord, help us to appear a reflection of Christ in us. Father, just help us and, and uh, strengthen us as a, uh, your church, as your body. And we pray in your